Hey everyone, Contrail here, and welcome to the third layer of the most complete iceberg. I've got to say it feels pretty good being here uh, at layer three because I have finally crested the first hill uh, of this project, so to speak. Basically, from here on out, uh, these layers are going to be getting shorter by five entries every three layers. So starting at layer four, layers are going to be 30 entries long instead of 35, and layer seven on will be 25 entries. You get the idea. This also means that there will be a little less pressure on me, the creator, so we might start getting these out faster than once a month, which I am very excited for. I am also putting together a list of smaller videos that I'll start to work on after a little bit, probably after layer 7, but maybe a little earlier, who knows. Anyways, we have a lot of ground to cover in this last big layer, so I think we're just gonna go ahead and just get into it. So sit back and get comfortable as we dive into the third layer of the most complete iceberg. Eleven BX thirteen seventy one. 11BX1371 is a strange viral video that was discovered in May of 2015. It was initially publicized by a Swedish tech blog named GadgetZZ, who claimed to have been sent the video on a male DVD. The video is two minutes in length, with black and white visuals and features a discordant electronic soundtrack that is extremely hard to pin down or understand. The visual centerpiece is a man dressed in a dark robe and wearing a plague doctor mask. Over the course of the video, the man ambles around a destroyed building, occasionally making gestures and appears to stare into the camera. At one point, he reveals his right hand which has been fitted with a blinking light. When the video's sound spectrogram was analyzed, multiple messages were revealed to be hidden within. Additionally, images depicting torture and mutilation were discovered as well. Some theorize that the video was an ARG. Others believed it to be the creation of a deranged serial killer who was hiding clues to his crimes within the video. There were also those who simply thought the video was a publicity stunt by GadgetZZ, who wanted to extend their reach by making a viral video. After lengthy analysis, many of the scarier elements of the video were discovered to have been appropriated from other sources of media. The images of torture and mutilation were traced back to a victim of the Boston Strangler, a serial killer that was active in the 1960s, as well as stills from a horror film titled The Bunny Game. The messages were threatening in nature, talking about death and making vague connections to a cataclysmic event. The nature of these messages would lead some to believe it was a threat of bioterrorism, citing the theme of disease in some of the messages, as well as the focus on a plague doctor character in the video. In November of 2015, a Twitter user going by Parker Warner Wright announced that he had made the video. In order to prove he was the creator, Wright would state that in 1.44 metric hours from his posting on Twitter, a sequel to 11BX1371 would be uploaded to his YouTube channel of the same name. At the specified time, Wright posted a video named 11B31369 to his channel. This video was in much the same style as 11BX1371, and featured the Plague Doctor character once again. This time, he was joined by a woman in a white dress who wore bandages that covered her face. This was enough for many to prove that he was behind the video. So, in an interview, um, Parker Warner Wright actually stated that he was an American citizen uh, living in Poland, and he made the video as kind of an art project. I, I guess it's a good thing that art is interpretive, because that's not the first thing I would have expected that to be. He says that he posted the video to 4chan, um, as well as put it on several DVDs that he left in a park, a subway, and the final one he did mail to GadgetZZ, which is where it was first heavily publicized. And back to that thought about um, art being interpretive, 
Um, there were a lot of people who thought that this was a way bigger deal than it realistically was. I know a lot of people interpreted this message at one point to be a threat against uh, Barack Obama, as in one of the messages that they found, um, it alludes to something along the lines of joining together to fight the Black Beast. Um, I don't think I need to connect the dots, you know, Barack Obama, Black Beast. There were also apparently uh, coordinates to the White House somewhere in there. Wasn't able to confirm that myself, but I'm just going to take it at face value, I guess. And Wright did say that there was a political connotation to the video, but he did deny it uh, being a terrorist threat, um, which is good, I guess. Just as kind of like a quick uh, closing remark, I guess, the soundtrack of this video reminds me of uh, some pieces of Henry Eats, which is another creepy short animation that I remember from back in the day. I don't know, I just made a quick connection in my brain when I was listening to it. Um, and maybe you'll agree with me, maybe you won't. But anyways, I think we're going to go ahead and move on to the next one. MK Ultra. MK Ultra was a clandestine experimentation program conducted by the CIA. Its aim was to investigate the functions of psychotropic drugs and psychological techniques as truth agents and programmers against humans. In the beginning of the Cold War, it was deemed that Soviet intrusion into the US government was a real and present threat. To combat this, the CIA aimed to develop countermeasures that would allow them to force confessions from foreign agents, as well as subconsciously program people to carry out their bidding using code words or triggers. In order to accomplish this, the CIA carried out some of the most infamous cases of human experimentation that have been documented. Projects were run from 1953 to 1973, with the majority of known operations using front organizations which looked normal on the surface, but privately answered to the CIA. These projects were, to say the least, horribly unethical and dangerous for the subjects. Some were not even informed that they would be participating at all, being brought into the project under the guise of receiving treatment for a mental disorder. Depending on the subproject they resided in, subjects would be drugged with psychotropics like LSD or mescaline, undergo extensive electroshock therapy, or locked in solitary confinement and subjected to psychic driving audio stimulus. Or, if they were really unlucky, a combination of any of these. At the end of the program in 1973, the Watergate scandal had just recently been exposed to the American public. Amidst the fear of inquest, CIA Director Richard Helms ordered the destruction of all documents and data relating to MKUltra. When the program was publicly revealed in 1975 by the Church Commission, efforts to investigate were stonewalled due to the lack of information. So as far as uh, government fuckery goes, uh, MK Ultra is pretty high up there. You know, human experimentation of really any kind is extremely hard to think about and condone. But MK Ultra is a definitely special um, amongst the bunch because if it weren't for a bureaucratic mistake of massive proportions, we probably would know next to nothing about this project. So in 1977, a couple of guys made a FOIA request regarding MK Ultra, and during the course of trying to fulfill this FOIA, um, they found a cache of 20,000 documents from MK Ultra that were not destroyed during the data purge. And this was because they had been uh, improperly stored, and when they went to go destroy the files, they didn't realize that these were missing because they were just in a completely different place than they should have been. Everything we now know about MKUltra comes from those 20,000 documents, the few that survived the initial 73 purge, and sworn testimony from those who worked on the project. And if we think MKUltra is horrible from this tiny little window that we were shown uh, through these documents and the testimony, just imagine what else we don't know about and never will because all evidence to it has been destroyed. And likely a lot of the people who worked on this project have either been sworn to secrecy or have died. So we'll just, we'll never know, you know? It's just, it's, it's poof, it's gone in the wind. I just thought that was kind of unsettling um, and might be something that you'd want to chew on. So I think we're going to go ahead and move on uh, to the next entry. Gansfeld Experiment. 
A Gansfeld experiment is a parapsychological assessment used to determine if someone possesses ESP or any number of telepathic abilities. It's believed that when sensory input is removed or reduced, psychic abilities are enhanced in the subject, allowing a receiver to be sent mental images from a sender. The sender usually has multiple targets that they can choose from. The receiver is also asked to speak out loud and describe the images that they see in their state of sensory deprivation. All of this is then recorded by a proctor, who is visually isolated from the sender and receiver so as to create integrity around the results. Unsurprisingly, the results of Gansfeld experiments are notoriously difficult to consistently replicate, which suggests that the phenomena does not exist and is simply a case of mistaken significance from the results. Critics cite how a deviation in statistical baseline does not necessarily mean that ESP exists and point out how controlling factors in Gansfeld experiments can be overlooked and thus change the outcome of the results. Things like how soundproof the subject's room is and the randomization of the psychic targets can create external factors that destroy the results' credibility. Denver Airport Conspiracy The Denver International Airport in Colorado has been shrouded in mystery and conspiracies since its construction in 1989 and completion in 1995. Starting in the beginning, its opening was delayed by multiple issues pertaining to budget and system integration. The airport went $3 billion over budget, with officials denoting the automated baggage system as the culprit. Apparently, it was quite finicky and prone to malfunctioning, which resulted in its removal in 2005. However, some dismissed the baggage system as the root cause, instead drawing attention to the vast tunnel network that was constructed underneath the airport. People theorize that these tunnels contain bunkers and hideouts for the super elite, NORAD, as well as reptilians. Similar to the tunnels underneath Disney World, nicknamed Utilidors, airport administration has gone on record saying these tunnels are used to facilitate maintenance operations and house the automated baggage system, which had to connect to each terminal on the huge complex. Speaking of, the airport is also massive, encompassing 136 square kilometers of land, which makes it the second biggest airport in the world. Some are at a loss as to why Denver of all places would need this much room to operate, and once again point to a conspiracy involving the airport hiding something bigger. In reality, Denver is one of the busiest airports in the world, charting at number 3 as of 2022, with nearly 70 million passengers that year. This is due to its central location in the US, which acts as a major hub for connecting flights. It also hosts its own successful roster of international flights. The airport has also made use of Freemason imagery, which is a dog whistle for believers in the New World Order. It also hosts a time capsule sponsored by the former, which is slated to be opened in 2094. Some theorize that it contains important information or evidence of their activities, but this is unable to be proven currently. Another oddity is the 32-foot-tall statue named Blue Mustang. It depicts a blue horse with glowing red eyes rearing on its hind legs. The statue has garnered infamy in part due to its imposing nature and the circumstances of its completion. In 2006, a section from the statue fell and hit its creator, Luis Jimenez. Unfortunately, this severed an artery in his leg, and he bled out before he reached a hospital. This has led some to believe that the statue is cursed or possessed by a demon. After a while, airport administration began to embrace the conspiracies being made about them, making multiple marketing campaigns that poked fun at them, and coincided with an increase in revenue. They've also become supernatural sister airports with Roswell International Air Center. So I've never been uh, to the Denver airport, um, I envy two at one point, <laughs> but I've got to say I do deeply admire their administration for embracing the conspiracy theories. I mean, that's really exactly what you have to do. I mean, if you face having your reputation ruined by some weird, stupid nonsense or whatever, just play into it. Just play into it and, and everything will work out. Uh, in the end, and I think that's what happened ultimately uh, with Denver. I mean, I've seen a couple of images of the advertising stuff that they do, um, like when they're constructing a new area off to the side, there'll be like, what is behind this? A, like a Freemason gathering, or an alien autopsy, or just a regular like airport thing. It's like a multiple choice. It's fun, you know, it's just cool. Um, and I, I guess it is, you know, 
tinged with a little bit of like you know corporate backdrop to it but i still think it's fun and ultimately i do think that the denver airport is just a it's just an airport it's a very busy airport that sorely needed uh that upgrade i was researching this apparently because denver was so important um but also outdated at the same time um it would lead to nationwide um air traffic halts basically like traffic jams basically you know they couldn't get planes out of the airport fast enough to facilitate the rest of air travel over america so it sounds like they definitely needed the upgrade and i'm glad they got it ultimately so i think that sums it up pretty well and i think we're gonna go ahead and move on to the next one the tunguska event the Tunguska event was a massive explosion that occurred over the Podkemnia Tunguska River in Siberia. In 1908, a meteor estimated to be about 65 meters across streaked through the Earth's atmosphere at a speed of 27 kilometers per second. As it hurtled towards the ground, the raw heat generated by ram pressure caused the meteor to explode in a massive airburst almost 3 miles in the sky. It flattened 2,150 square kilometers of forest and was estimated to be equivalent to 3 to 5 megatons of TNT, but could have been as large as 10 megatons according to some simulations. The shockwave was picked up by seismographs all over the world, from Denmark to the United States. While not the largest meteor to hit the Earth by a long shot, it has been confirmed as the largest meteor event in recorded history. The Tunguska event also shares some similarities with the 2013 Shelyabinsk meteor, which is unique in the fact that there is a great amount of data surrounding its entry to Earth's atmosphere, as well as its impact. Researchers have used data from the Chelyabinsk event to simulate Tunguska more accurately and study meteor entry and dispersal patterns. I Love Bees I Love Bees was an ARG developed by 42 Entertainment to market Halo 2 in 2004. It depicts a website which appears to be corrupted due to random data fragments appearing on screen and disrupting the page. The website was initially revealed in a trailer for Halo 2. At the end, we can briefly see the link to xbox.com change to ilovebees.com. When participants arrived at the site, they were immediately thrust into figuring out what caused the website to become corrupted. It was discovered that an AI from the Halo universe had somehow infiltrated the programming of this website, which was causing it to glitch and show pieces of its memory on the pages. In addition to the visual bugs, the AI provided 210 GPS coordinates which coincided with payphones around the world, referred to as axons. The axons, once unlocked with information from the ARG, would give players progress towards pre-recorded messages that acted out an audio drama. These messages contained invaluable information about the plot of I Love Bees. Once this was realized, people everywhere made it a priority to seek out these axons to unlock new information. At one point, a participant hung around a payphone that was in the path of Hurricane Francis, which was sweeping through Florida at the time. Apparently, after this fact was realized, the payphone operator temporarily broke character and insisted that the player take shelter. Eventually, the majority of these axons were activated and initiated the final phase of the ARG. This involved certain players being contacted by the organizers, who invited them to special events hosted in malls or cinemas across America. Here the participants of I Love Bees were awarded with the opportunity to play Halo 2 early and receive commemorative items for their efforts. Despite being only tangentially related to the Halo timeline, the ARG was still well received by Halo fans and considered one of the better pieces of Halo media to have existed. The Philadelphia Experiment The Philadelphia Experiment was an alleged military project conducted in 1943 on the USS Eldridge, a cannon-class Navy destroyer. According to the account of a merchant mariner named Carl M. Allen, he witnessed the ship turn invisible while in port at the Philadelphia Naval Shipyard. Afterwards, he also claims to have seen the ship teleport away and reappear several minutes later. The crew on board the ship were apparently stricken by multiple illnesses after returning, with some unlucky men seemingly merging into the deck of the ship and becoming stuck. His account was brought to light after he began a letter correspondence with the ufologist Morris Jessup, during which he warned him about the consequences of researching UFOs and proposed several theories regarding the Philadelphia experiment. 
When Alan was asked for more information by Jessup, he would state that his memory would need to be recovered, and produced a newspaper article about a seemingly unrelated disappearance at a bar. Alan would also give an annotated copy of Morris Jessup's book, The Case for the UFO, to the Office of Naval Research as another piece of evidence. The annotations within denote support for Allen's claims and appear to be made by several different people. After investigating these claims, and even inviting Jessup himself to examine the book and its contents, nothing of substance was ever found to support the existence of the experiment. Because of the lack of information and credibility, many doubt Allen's account as being genuine. Some interpret the Philadelphia experiment as a gross misunderstanding of degaussing technology, which was being fielded to naval ships as a countermeasure against sea mines. Others simply believe that the entire story is a fraud and shouldn't be taken seriously. Elisa Lamb Elisa Lamb was a 21-year-old student at the University of British Columbia who was centered in one of the strangest missing person cases of 2013. Prior to her disappearance, Lamb was an avid blogger who documented her life across two separate pages on Blogspot and Tumblr respectively. She would post content related to fashion and detail her various struggles with mental illness namely depression and bipolar disorder. She feared that her future could be jeopardized due to gaps in her school transcript that were caused by her mental struggles. It's clear that she cared immensely about being able to finish her studies and wanted to be free of her illness. Despite this being her outward priority though, some of her behavior did not reflect this sentiment. According to her family, Lamb had a history of not taking her medication, or not taking enough. At several points, this led her to having hallucinations that caused her to hide under her bed and even temporarily flee her home. However, they vehemently affirm that she had never had suicidal ideations of any kind. On January 31st, 2013, the day she disappeared, Lamb was in the midst of a trip to the state of California. She had arrived in Los Angeles on the 26th and visited several landmarks, including the San Diego Zoo. She was staying at the Cecil Hotel, also known as the Stay on Main Hotel. That day, her itinerary stated that she was to check out and catch a bus to Santa Cruz, a few hours north. Up until then, Lamb had maintained daily correspondence with her parents over the phone, but failed to call them that night and confirm her departure. Fearing that something was wrong, her family contacted the LAPD, who immediately started looking for her. Her family would also depart for Los Angeles a short time later to help with the search. Arriving at the hotel, LAPD officers would search Lamb's room on the fifth floor and confirm that she was missing. They also conducted a search of the entire hotel using dogs. However, due to the limits of probable cause, officers were unable to search the entire fifth floor, which leads some to believe that details may have been missed in the initial investigation. For the first week, investigators got no leads on Lamb's disappearance. Flyers with her name and information were put up on February 6th, which jumpstarted her case's presence in the media. Several people, including the manager of a bookstore and some hotel guests, reported seeing her around on the day she disappeared. The manager stated that Lamb was very friendly and had browsed the store for a book to take back to her family in Canada. However, testimony from the hotel guests would tell a different, darker story. They would state that Lamb was very strange and acted almost paranoid during their interactions. Initially, Lamb had been placed in a communal room at the Cecil Hotel, but had been moved to her own room after reports from the latter guests. At one point, she had locked the door and refused to let the others in unless they gave a password. She also left them notes which asked them to go away or go home. It was also revealed that Lamb had attended a live taping of Conan several days before her disappearance. However, she was escorted off-site by security due to disruptive behavior and reports from other attendees. These reports of paranoid behavior were further corroborated when the LAPD released security footage detailing Lamb on the day she disappeared. In the two and a half minute video, we see Lamb entering an elevator by herself while acting very scared and paranoid. At several points in the video, she peers out from the elevator into the hallway, like she's being followed. She also fidgets with the elevator panel repeatedly, and makes strange movements that do not seem natural. On February 19th, a maintenance worker at the Cecil Hotel was performing an inspection of the water system on the roof of the building. Multiple customers had lodged complaints about low water pressure in their showers, 
as well as a strange color and taste coming from the tap water. Believing there to be a clog in one of the tanks causing a backup, maintenance was dispatched to diagnose the issue. When the worker opened up one of the four 1,000 gallon water tanks to inspect it, he was horrified to discover the cause of the hotel's problem. Then yesterday, the maintenance worker responding to some concerns about some water problems at the hotel went and checked the rooftop's water tanks. There are four of them. When he looked in one of them, that's when he made the gruesome discovery. The fire department investigators have been here. They did identify her through body markings. At this point, the autopsy is still being conducted. Frederica is still waiting for that. Elisa Lamb's body was found to be in a state of moderate decay, and bloating appeared consistent with being immersed in water for nearly three weeks. Separation of the skin had begun, and there were no outward signs of physical assault. A toxicology screen did not find any recreational drugs in her system, but did detect a small amount of alcohol in her blood. Trace amounts of prescription drugs like Seroquel were found as well, which is used to treat bipolar disorder. The prescription drugs were in small enough amounts that it infers regular dosage had ceased in the days prior to her death. After her autopsy, it was declared that her death was accidental and can be attributed to a psychotic episode brought on by her bipolar disorder. Because she had a history of not taking her medication, it can be surmised that she'd recently stopped medicating and, as a result, entered an altered mental state. This has the potential to explain her behavior in the elevator, as well as her paranoid state prior to her disappearance. However, some theorize that the truth is darker than that. People were quick to point out that the water tanks on the roof were fitted with a special mechanism that required a tool to open, and were tall enough to need a ladder to get on top of. Presumably, Lamb would not have access to such a tool or a ladder, and would be incapable of opening up the tank in order to crawl inside. Due to this, many believe that Lamb was murdered by a guest or worker at the Cecil Hotel, who used the water tank as a way to dispose of her body and remove evidence of their involvement. Others also point to her Tumblr blog as evidence of a third party, which was updated multiple times after her disappearance. They claim this is proof that someone stole her phone and assumed her identity while she was dead. However, detractors have pointed out that Lamb could have queued these posts to publish on a schedule, so it leaves that aspect of the case unclear. Okay, uh, color me a little bit creeped out um, by the story of Elisa Lamb. It is never overly fun to see people going through that kind of a uh, mental crisis on camera, and especially realizing that she died because of it. It's just very creepy uh, seeing her final moments um, on camera and just seeing how how scared she was. Yeah, I've got to say, um, I'm not a huge subscriber to the murder theory that gets passed around, and I'm going to explain why. Uh, to tackle the first point that a lot of people make in regards to, oh, she needed a tool and she needed a ladder to get up to the tank. The hotel worker that would actually find uh, Elisa Lamb's body, he would state... Um, in an interview that when he went up to inspect the tank, the mechanism was already opened, um, which immediately explains how Lamb was able to crawl in there. It was already unlocked. More than likely, a previous maintenance worker just didn't really feel the need to lock it. I mean, looking at it now, it's definitely negligent to not lock the tank when you're done inspecting it, but at the same time, I can see why, you know, a maintenance worker would probably just skip out on not locking it, because who do you think is going to crawl up onto the roof of a hotel and, and, and crawl into a water tank, you know? Others also talk about, you know, how she even got onto the roof, um, because a lot of people will point out that the elevators don't actually run up to the top floor where the stair access will let you go up to the roof, and that's a good point. Um, however, I have an excellent... Uh, counterpoint to that, uh, the fire escape. The fire escapes on the Cecil Hotel do in fact go from the top of the building to the bottom, um, and they have to, because that's just, you know, that's code. They, they have to have an exit off the roof in case there's a fire, and the fire escape allows that. Apparently there was also a report that a police dog picked up Elisa Lamb's scent near a window that had access to the fire escape, so that potentially is how she might have 
uh, crawled out onto the fire escape and gone to the roof uh, through that window. And overall, the police investigation just really didn't find any other signs that this was, you know, an intentional homicide. The autopsy revealed no physical damage that wasn't consistent with her being in the water tank. So I'm just generally kind of, you know, locked in to stick with my guns and say that it was more than likely just a girl who stopped taking her medication. She had a psychotic episode and she, she got scared. She ran and she found a place to hide and unfortunately, the place she decided to hide in was a water tank that she couldn't get out of, and she she ultimately passed away. It's ultimately a, a tragic situation, and I, I leave my condolences with her family and everybody else that's been affected by this. But I think that was a good enough piece on Elisa Lam, uh, and I think we should go ahead and move on to the next one. Project Blue Book Project Blue Book was a study conducted by the U.S. Air Force from 1952 to 1969. Its aim was twofold, to analyze data collected from reports of UFOs and to determine if said UFOs constituted a threat to national security. Over the course of nearly two decades, countless investigators and researchers collected and examined thousands of reports of UFO activity across the U.S. Some well-known cases that were investigated include the Lonnie Zamora encounter, the Kecksburg incident, the Flatwoods monster, and the Roswell crash. After the project had run its course, it released its findings to the public and gave a statement regarding the UFO mystery. Of the 12,618 cases reported to Blue Book, 69% of cases were deemed as identifiable, 22% were deemed unknown, and 9% did not contain enough information to reach a conclusion. In addition to this, the Air Force would maintain that just because they were unable to identify the UFO does not mean it was an alien craft or constituted a threat. For some, this is not what they wanted to hear. The majority of UFO organizations deemed Blue Book to be a sham, meant to divert attention and credibility away from the existence of extraterrestrials and their interactions with humans. The National Investigation Committee of Aerial Phenomena, otherwise known as NICAP, was extremely critical of Blue Book in their efforts, and gained almost 15,000 members in the 1960s owing to distrust of the Air Force and their methods. So I think the Air Force kind of hoped that Blue Book would be kind of the nail in the coffin for a lot of uh, UFO culture. You know, they finally come out in full force they investigate all of these sightings, they give, you know, fairly reasonable explanations for everything, but a lot of the UFO community is not really in it for the reasonable uh, explanations. And if the Air Force's intention was to use Blue Book as a means of uh, placating the masses in regards to UFOs, um, they were kind of doomed before they started, really. Because you've got the people accused of trying to cover something up, then being the ones who have to turn around and explain why everything is fine and there wasn't a cover up and it was really just this. At the end of the day, you know, you're not going to be placating the people who you wanted to. Um, you're just going to be making yourself look more guilty in their eyes because you are trying to explain all of these things that are immediately unexplainable. Some ufologists will be digging through like a pile of documents and they'll find something and it they, they show it to the whole world like, this is the proof, this is it. And then the government comes out and says, that's fake, it's not real. And then all the ufologists just go like, Lisa no Gaib. They just take it as confirmation that what the government just said was fake is actually real. And I guess I can't really blame them because the government does lie a lot about certain things and they and they cover stuff up so it's really just kind of like a free-for-all um when it comes to these documents and this has happened a ton of times you know this has happened with you know jfk um mj12 that's a perfect transition into our next entry majestic 12 
Majestic 12 is a purported government committee that was discovered in 1987 by ufologist Timothy Good. According to him, he came into possession of a set of documents that appear to state the creation of a 12-man committee in 1947 by President Harry Truman. The committee's task, the investigation and capture of crashed UFOs and their occupants. Unsurprisingly, ufologists immediately clung to the MJ-12 documents as confirmation that the last 40 years of government investigations and explanations were false. They touted the documents as irrefutable and rallied to push further into the government for answers. In addition to their stated activities, Majestic 12 has also been accused of ordering cover-ups of UFO sightings and counters, and have been tied to the enigmatic Men in Black. And speaking of... Men in Black Men in Black are reported government agents who are said to be responsible for the harassment, interrogation, and even death of UFO witnesses and ufologists. In many cases, people who encounter them report that they wear dark suits from which their name is derived and act quite strange, almost robotically. The first recorded counter with a man in black was reported by Harold Dahl, the initial claimant of the Maury Island incident. He claimed that a man in a dark suit warned him to keep quiet about what he'd seen and alluded to something bad happening if he talked. Ever since then, Men in Black have been incorporated into many cases of UFO encounters and sightings, often coming through in the aftermath to sanitize the events and keep people quiet. Yeah, so as much as it sucks to say, uh, it's very likely that MJ-12 uh, is, is fake. It doesn't exist. After being examined by multiple third parties and even a couple of ufologists who wanted to believe this as well, and they more or less determined that a good deal of the document is pretty much just stitched together from other FBI documents, that in the Cutler Twining memo um, that kind of confirms MJ-12 after the fact, that was also more than likely faked, and the two were kind of uh, combined together to make this kind of UFO red pill for everybody. Obviously, uh, the guys that called MJ-12 uh, fake, they were labeled as uh, disinformation agents by other ufologists who desperately wanted this to be true, and that's generally uh, par for the course, you know, anybody that doesn't take that information at face value um, has a higher likelihood of being attacked by the people who want to believe it's real. And this generally uh, brings me around to something that I've wanted to say uh, for a while now in regards to UFO culture. In my opinion, it is not a coincidence that UFO culture and a lot of sightings uh, took off into the mainstream post-1973 um, because that coincides with the Watergate scandal. And the reason that that is so um, important to this is because Watergate was a huge turning point for America, both politically and culturally, because... God, mother... Basically, the entirety of America kind of realized collectively that the higher-ups in government have no problem lying to everybody if it means that they get to have their way. And now all of a sudden, these crazy conspiracy theories, they seem a lot more probable now that people are aware that, you know, people will lie to protect their bottom line. And then by extension, I think stuff like the Men in Black are a byproduct of this as well. You know, now all of a sudden, people are fearing that the government are gonna go around and start silencing people and, you know, kind of controlling things. And that kind of piles on to examples of, like, Red Scare that was already prevalent in America. And so it just generally got everybody kind of caught up in this perfect storm. I think that's kind of uh, more than enough said, but one more thing um, before we go, I have a slight critique for the FBI. If you're going to say that the MJ-12 docs are fake, why do you have them accessible on your official website? Like, it, it just doesn't make sense to me. If you're going to say that they're fake, just denounce them and take them off your website. It just makes them look more real 
and it just it, it just looks bad for you I, i'm just trying i'm just trying to do you a favor man i just saying you might want to take them away if you think they're fake anyways i think we're gonna go ahead and move on uh to the next one fire festival fire festival likely needs little introduction it was the brainchild of entrepreneur Billy McFarland and rapper Ja Rule. The two had met at a networking event hosted by McFarland's credit card company, Magnesis, and had kept in touch. At one point, the pair found themselves on a private plane cruising through the Bahamas when they touched down on a small island named Norman's K. They would come to find that Norman's K had prior ties to the Medellin cartel, infamously led by Pablo Escobar, as a smuggling base. According to testimony by former members, the island was a hub for Escobar's associate, Carlos Letter, to smuggle cocaine into Florida. When the island was under his control, it was like a constant party was going on, with no rules about what you could do. McFarland and Rule had the idea to host a festival there, in an attempt to recapture that sense of complete freedom. Uh, within reason, though. We're not talking about, like, murder and drugs, people. Okay, maybe a little bit of drugs, but I digress. They could also use it to promote the Fire app, a venture by McFarlane that would be used to book music events and talent. After the two broached the idea to the owners of Norman's K, they tentatively agreed to host Fire Festival under the rigid condition that McFarlane make no references to either the Medellin Cartel or Pablo Escobar in the event marketing. As one does, McFarland immediately began marketing Fire Festival as a transformative event, which would host guests in stunning modern villas over two weekends, complete with food cooked by celebrity chefs and live music from prolific artists. And all of this was to be hosted on an island once owned by Blackbeard the Pirate and Pablo Escobar. Understandably, the owners of Norman's K immediately ceased all dealings with McFarland, much to him and his staff's chagrin. Because they had just set a very high expectation in their marketing, they now had to deliver in four months or risk defaulting on their finances and ruining their collective reputations. First, they had to find a new venue. Unable to return to Norman's K, they went for the next best thing they could find, Roker Point on the island of Great Exuma. It wasn't a private island by any stretch, being a premier tourist destination in the Bahamas and a short walk from a sandals resort. It wasn't even particularly lavish or pretty. It was an isolated parking lot attached to a marina where locals would keep their boats. However, it was the best they could do on short notice. Next was the accommodations. Despite what some people think, McFarland did do a few things right when it came to Fire Festival. For one, he hired veteran event organizers who had a very good record in the industry. Unfortunately, these organizers, being quite experienced, told him a great many things that he didn't want to hear. The consensus among these staff was that the event was much too large in scale. Things needed to be cut, or the overall quality of the event would take a nosedive. The first thing to be reduced was housing. Instead of thoughtful, sleek villas with luxury furniture, attendees would be given geodesic disaster relief tents. Yeah, the kind that the UN gives out after an earthquake or a civil war. They are cheap, utilitarian, and not particularly comfortable even with the included mattress. But this had to be done to ensure both cost reduction and ease of integration. This cut alone sheared $10 million off the event's price tag. Next, the food was scaled back from a gourmet island experience with a total price tag of $6 million to a small-time caterer that was given a $1 million budget two weeks before the festival went live. Conveniently, the festival began on the same weekend as Exuma Regatta, an important sailing competition in the Bahamas that temporarily occupied most of the island's industry, like hotels, rentals, and, oh, food services. How convenient. As for turning a marina parking lot into a sultry private island, uh, they worked with what they had. They brought in dump trucks of sand to try and cover up the gravel lot, but it only somewhat worked. They also built cabanas and a few swing seats on the nearby beach to try and give it some style. It seems like the only thing they didn't skimp out on was the live music. Fire Festival was slated to have 33 headlining artists perform, with names like Major Lazer, Lil Yachty, Blink-182, and Tyga on the lineup. 
But in a final sign of things to come, every live music performance pulled out in the final days leading up to the festival. With all this on their shoulders and the implications of their failure apparent, the decision to postpone was obvious. Yeren Lavi, one of the primary organizers, said in an interview that the festival leadership had been discussing postponing until at least the fall in November. That way they would have a real shot at delivering on everything they promised in the marketing. However, McFarland and his loyalists insisted on following through with the event in the spring as planned, despite everything that had been laid out in front of them. One of the organizers said something that I think perfectly sums up the attitude towards Fire Festival. I believe the quote was, Let's just do it and be legends, man. And legends they became. After the attendees landed at Great Exuma, they were shepherded to a beach party where they were given complimentary alcohol and told to wait for transport to the site. This would take over six hours, during which last minute preparations to the site were made by a hastily assembled domestic workforce. When the attendees arrived at the site, many were quickly brought to the realization that they had been taken for a ride. The sheer number of things that were wrong was, to say the least, hilarious. Their tents and beds, which had been arranged prior to their arrival, had all been soaked by a rainstorm that swept over the island that morning. Additionally, they somehow didn't manage to get enough tents or beds for all the attendees, which led to people just stealing each other's or sleeping outside. Luggage arrived in a shipping container in the middle of the night, which led to confusion as people sifted through the pile trying to find their stuff. Multiple attendees reported having their belongings stolen or misplaced. When food was brought out by the staff, it was definitely a far cry from gourmet. We're talking school lunch specials all around, and for the low, low price tag of $1,500. And that brings me to probably the biggest point of contention around this whole thing, the ticket price. It could cost you, in the best case scenario, with a discount that was valid for 24 hours, $995 for a solo ticket that was good for one weekend of the festival, not both. As a last minute replacement for the headlining artists, a local band would play music for a few hours and then leave. At this point, many had lost their buzz from the complimentary tequila and were generally just pissed off so they went to sleep. The organizers didn't even bother with the second day. They made the announcement in the morning that the festival was postponed until further notice and began coordinating with Exuma International Airport to get everyone flights back to Miami. Unfortunately, it is never that simple. The immense amount of people trying to leave all at once caused a great deal of turmoil at the airport. This would all come to a head when the Bahaman government would temporarily block all inbound flights to Great Exuma and lock the attendees, many of which were dehydrated and hungover, in the airport terminal without any amenities. It was reported that at least one person lost consciousness due to heat stroke. Thankfully, everyone would leave the island soon after, supposedly after several high-profile guests reached out to the US Embassy in an effort to move things along. When the dust settled and everyone made it home, people moved from repose to retaliation. A total of nine lawsuits were leveled against both Billy McFarland and Ja Rule, claiming false advertising, negligence, breaches of contract, and everything in between. Rule would mostly wash himself of any responsibility and claim that he was also defrauded by McFarland during and after the festival. He was dismissed from several of the class action suits against the organizers. This pretty much leaves Billy and some key members of his team holding the bag. He immediately went into damage control, trying to pin the blame on circumstances outside of his control and financial sabotage. This wouldn't work though, and he was forced to bear his punishment. On June 30th, he was arrested by federal agents and charged with wire fraud in relation to Fire Festival. After paying his $300,000 bail, he masterminded another fraud scheme named NYC VIP Access, which endeavored to sell tickets to events like Coachella and Burning Man. He pleaded guilty to defrauding investors in 2018 and was sentenced to six years in prison, but was released in 2022 after serving only four years. Okay, so maybe this is a bit of a strange or controversial opinion, but I keep having this like vague fantasy of wanting to be scammed 
at Fire Festival. It seems kind of counterintuitive, I guess, when you think about it, because, you know, this guy took a ton of people's money and then gave them just an absolutely awful experience in return, but I don't know. I mean, there's just something about being able to say that, like, I was at Fire Festival. Like, that just sounds so appealing to me. Like, I want that title. I want to be able to say that I was a part of this absolute shit show. You know, maybe I'm alone in that, but gosh, I just would have loved to have been a fly on that wall, so to speak. I mean, just seeing everything just getting totally screwed up. But thankfully, uh, if you are like me and have a vague fantasy of being scammed by a millennial entrepreneur, then uh, you're in luck because as of April 2023, McFarland uh, stated that there was a Fire Festival 2 uh, in the works and I could not be more uh, excited. Apparently tickets have already sold out, um, which I guess I kind of half expected and I'm also kind of disappointed because kind of wanted to pick one up for myself, but who knows? I mean, apparently it's being held at a resort, so maybe I could just drop by and, and, and check it out that way, I don't know. But I'm hoping that this next go around, they go ahead and, you know, revive some of the concepts that they had to cut from the first festival because they were flat broke and didn't know how to spend their money. I really hope that they bring back the treasure hunt that they advertised initially. Like, I haven't seen anybody talk about this really, um, but if you go onto the Wayback Machine and like check out their website, they reference a million dollar treasure hunt where like you can find clues all over the event grounds that like slowly lead you to like buried treasure like a pirate map basically and you would get a million bucks if you found the end of that honestly dude billy mcfarland for that he was a visionary i mean pff, fuck eat your heart out mr beast billy mcfarland had the idea first stop dragging on his coattails um obviously i'm i'm kind of being sarcastic for the sake of being sarcastic but i don't know i guess i'm really excited to see um what mcfarland has in store for us next considering that this time he cannot pull the rug out from under his customers or he will go back to prison <laughs> so he kind of has to give everybody a good time uh now that he sold us all on fire festival too so be looking forward to that bud uh when it comes out anyways let's go ahead and move on uh to the next one shoe nice shoe nice real name christopher shuey is a youtuber who is best known for his eating challenges and liquor slams he began posting videos in 2008 after his young son created a channel for him in the earlier days of youtube it was much easier to grow a channel from nothing especially if you had an interesting talent to show off in the case of shunice who called himself the human garbage disposal he was seemingly capable of eating pretty much anything that viewers suggested. Raw meat, Pokemon cards, entire bottles of hot sauce, nothing was off limits. Because of this, Shunice quickly gained fame as that guy on YouTube who would eat an entire roll of toilet paper in 10 minutes, only to turn around on a dime and chug a whole bottle of Everclear, and capture it all on camera. People flocked to his channel to see what ridiculous thing he would eat next. The liquor slams were especially popular and made up a good deal of his regular uploads. However, after a little while in the spotlight, Shunice began to fade from relevancy, much to his chagrin. To many viewers, his content had become stale and predictable after a while, and it simply wasn't interesting anymore. I mean, you can only watch a guy slam full bottles of 80 proof liquor so many times before you either get bored or concerned. It was crystal clear to anyone who watched his videos that Shunice was an alcoholic, and the channel was his way of justifying his addiction. He was also accused of doing some pretty shady stuff while trying to recover his fame. Examples include soliciting donations to fund his lifestyle, as well as withholding payment from editors who helped him with the channel. He was also accused of grooming a minor into starting a relationship with him, and subsequently fleeing his home in Florida to lay low in Denver, Colorado. 
However, the girl he supposedly groomed came out and made a video denouncing these claims and defending Shunice, so it's unclear as to what actually happened. Leave Shunice the fuck alone. First of all, he's innocent. He never to me. Understood? In 2018, his main channel was terminated by YouTube. He also quit drinking after he began to fear he would die of alcohol poisoning. Nowadays, Shunice barely clings to his prior fame on YouTube and averages less than 10,000 views a video. He also heavily pushes his Cameo, a service that allows users to request personalized videos from creators. So I'll admit, uh, I didn't watch Shunice uh, in his prime, if you can even call it that. Um, I did go and watch some of his newer videos on uh, Shunice22, his second channel that he's posting from now. And I pretty much already said this, but he's in a pretty rough spot when it comes to views. Um, we're talking less than 10,000. It's kind of more like seven to 8,000 now. Um, since he stopped posting regularly about three years ago. It's also kind of funny that when you go into the comments of those videos and you like see him replying to people who are leaving comments like, yeah, man, you know, cool, I remember you from the old days. Um, his reply to the comment will always have a link to the cameo without fail. Like that's just, it's very clear that that is his kind of primary source of income from the internet is his cameo and it seems pretty pushy um if i'm being real but i get he's probably in that contingent of people who really can't let it go i mean like now that he's gotten a taste of internet fame um he has to keep holding on to whatever he has left which at this point is just kind of you know, early internet nostalgia. But I am at kind of a loss as to why he would want to be remembered as shoe nice, you know? Like, like of all the things, the, the human garbage disposal, that's your pick for a legacy. He's also just done a lot of things as shoe nice that are not super likable. You know, some of the stuff I already talked about, uh, you know, he withheld money from editors, he had grooming allegations leveled against him, but he also, like, left his wife and kids uh, in 2012, apparently, um, due to his channel and his pill addiction, like, a combination between the two. He's like, yeah, I was just, I was, I was doing the channel and she couldn't handle it. And, and that's the way that he put it um, in, I think it was a Vice documentary that they did about him. It just seems very kind of scummy. Um, overall, and he also tried to start a beef with H3H3 after going on their podcast, and regardless of your opinion on H3H3, you know, starting drama for clicks is just really the lowest form of grifting uh, on the platform, and I don't think people appreciate that in really any way. I guess the one good thing that he's done um, overall has been stopping his drinking, because that was probably one of the worst things uh, in his life, bar none. Um, but I guess just overall, I wish that he would just, you know, leave the platform and move on, because it, it feels like he's carrying a lot of baggage, and I just think he would be better off mentally if he just left YouTube behind and just tried to live a normal life. Um, or, you know, what little, I guess, he has left, because slamming all that liquor probably did a number uh, on his organs. So, yeah, shoe nice, uh, if you're out there, I hope you get through whatever you're going through, bud. Even if you were kind of a shithead in the past, I mean, I'm, I'm rooting for you to get better, man. Uh, seriously. Um, but I think we're gonna go ahead and move on, uh, to the next one. Boeing YAL-1. Okay, the Boeing YAL-1 is a bit of a standout on this list, for reasons that will become clear in a moment. The YAL-1 is literally just a 747 with a laser cannon strapped to it. That's it. That's why it's on the list, uh, cause it's fucking awesome. The YAL-1 was envisioned by the US Air Force as a proof of concept missile defense system that used a chemical oxygen iodine laser, otherwise known as COIL, to destroy enemy ordnance that was in the boost phase. Basically, this thing would shoot a laser at a missile and detonate it before it lands, eliminating it as a threat. Theoretically, this would be a much more effective countermeasure against enemy ordnance than something like the Sea Wiz or Sea Ram, which just shoots 20 mil high explosive at a rocket or artillery shell until it explodes.
After acquiring a 747-200 for testing, modifications were made to its airframe in preparation for mounting the laser. In an astonishing show of preschool manners, the big three ended up collaborating on this project. I am of course talking about Boeing, Lockheed Martin, and Northrop Grumman. Boeing supplied the planes, staff, and system integration. Lockheed Martin provided the fire control system and turret mount, and Northrop Grumman had the coil. Initial testing was very promising. The coil proved to be able to track its targets with extreme precision, as well as operate consistently at its target altitude at durations that were commensurate with a real engagement. This was enough for a second model to be approved, which was sent to Boeing in Wichita, Kansas for further testing. Over the next few years, the plane and laser were refined further, and seemed to be emerging as a new standard in energy weapon technology. In 2010, the YAL-1 successfully destroyed a liquid-fueled missile at the Point Mugu Naval Air Warfare Center in California. It also successfully engaged a solid fuel missile, but failed to destroy it due to a beam misalignment. Ultimately, the YAL-1 program was terminated by a bunch of loser buzzkills. Uh, oh, shoot, I misread that. It says, budget. Sorry about that. All told, the program cost a little over $5 billion, and that resulted in a high-maintenance plane that had no defenses except for a laser cannon that worked sometimes. Even though some could see its application after the kinks were ironed out down the road, it was deemed as being too expensive to continue justifying. Despite being cancelled, the YAL-1 remained an important source of information for similar energy weapon projects. One program by the MDA sought to put a laser on a high-altitude UAV, which could operate past the limits of a conventional piloted plane and target missiles hundreds of kilometers away. It's to my understanding that this demonstration was cancelled due to budget concerns. While the aerial applications of laser weapons are seemingly receding, ground-based systems have had more success. A unit designed for use on striker IAVs, designated SHORAD, has seen success in targeting and destroying drones using a 50 kilowatt laser. These might be exceptionally more relevant to the military right now due to the growing utility of drones in combat, as seen in the Ukraine war. The Hat Man the Hat Man is more or less a direct evolution of the Shadow Person phenomenon, which I talked about in the second layer. The notable difference between the two is obviously the presence of a hat in the silhouette of the Hat Man. Many will identify the Hat Man as wearing a fedora, though other types of hats have been reported as well. Additionally, some will claim to see him wearing a trench coat as well. Aside from a change in shape, there is not much inherently different about the Hat Man in comparison to a standard shadow person. Both are reported to appear during sleep paralysis and appear to have dark intentions. It has, however, become much more prolific than standard shadow people encounters recently, having found a foothold in social media as people describe their encounters with him to others online. Who built the pyramids? Who Built the Pyramids is referring to the misplaced conviction held by some that the Pyramids of Giza were not built by the ancient Egyptians. Rather, they are convinced that the pyramids were much too large and advanced to have been built without modern equipment. More often than not, the proposed architects are extraterrestrial species who visited Egypt thousands of years ago. Therefore, it is no surprise that those who believe the pyramids were built by a third party are ancient astronaut theorists. Which brings us to... Ancient Astronaut Theorism. Ancient Astronaut Theorism is a pseudoscientific belief set which states that spacefaring extraterrestrials have come into contact with humanity and directly facilitated the development of our biology, cultures, religions, and technology. Those who hold the belief that aliens have influenced humanity will cite various aspects of ancient cultures as anachronistic and beyond their perceived ability. Because of this, they endeavor to fill in the gaps of the current record with their own quote-unquote research and scientific inferences. In many cases, ancient astronaut theorists come off as being extremely naive 
and intellectually repressed. They are notorious for taking information at face value and neglecting critical thinking for the sake of forwarding their argument. Even in the face of irrefutable evidence or general consensus, they will maintain their hypotheses as being true and accuse others of trying to bury their way of thinking and silencing them. While they argue that this makes them quote unquote brave and strong in the face of oppression, I would counter that it makes them look nonsensical and stubbornly dense. There are few things in this world that fill me with as much rage and contempt as ancient astronaut theorism. Like, the things that these guys say is, is bar none, some of the worst, most damaging kind of conspiracy drivel out there. I just, they have astoundingly little faith in ancient human cultures. Like, they refuse to give a smidgen of credit to any ancient humans, or just humans, for that matter, for the construction or advancement of anything. Apparently, it's just too hard for us to have done these things, or it took a ton of effort, and we supposedly wouldn't have put that effort forward for whatever reason. I mean, the list of stuff that they give aliens credit for, it's comically long. I could, I could sit here until the sun goes down, and I wouldn't be able to name everything that they give aliens credit for. The pyramids, Mayan temples, written language, iron tools, transistors, radio, electricity, space travel, it's all aliens, apparently. Every single bit of it. Like, I feel just horrible for archaeologists who spend their entire lives sifting through this just debris and ancient manuscripts and carvings looking for an answer to try and just fill in a gap in the record. And there are people who bypass all of that. And they're just like, oh, pfft. Oh, it was the aliens. The aliens must have done it. It must have been the aliens that did that. It, completely disgraceful. Also, just a, just a little bit of a brain teaser, a little, little something for you to chew on. If aliens really did leave us all of this super great and advanced technology behind, where the fuck is it? Where is it? Can you, sh can you show us where it is? Like seriously, some of the stuff that they claim was left to us is pretty revolutionary, and I doubt we would have ever stopped using it. Like, ever. I mean, India apparently had these huge spaceships that, that were like more akin to flying buildings than anything. Where the hell did those go? Did they just park them in the mountains and, and throw the keys into the ocean? A and the Egyptians, apparently. Get a load of this. Apparently, the Egyptian statues, they double as massive data servers. You want to know why? You want to know why they think that? I swear your brain is going to explode when you hear it, just like mine did. Because in the modern day, okay, we have the ability to laser etch these quartz crystal disks with data. It's called like 5D data storage or something like that. I'll throw an image up. And, and, and because, because the red granite that Egyptian statues are made out of is composed of 55% quartz, that must mean they're a data server. I, I'm sorry, where did you make that connection? Can I see the peer-reviewed studies or the evidence? Did you put it in that guy's hair? Because if you did, I, I don't want it anymore. I think I'll, I'll pass. I'll find it another way. It, it makes no sense because none of what they say makes any sense. It also just pisses me off when they have accredited people on their show as some kind of like a scientific cameo, as if that's meant to prove that they're somehow valid or correct in their assumptions. As soon as someone appears on Ancient Aliens, I cannot and will no longer trust them any longer. I don't care what their credentials are, if they're willing to put their name on this garbage in any capacity other than a rebuttal or a correction, they no longer deserve to be taken seriously by academia or anyone for that matter. Okay, I'm gonna have a coronary if I keep this up, so I'm gonna cut myself off. Expect a video series on this matter because I am not even close to being done with this crap yet. Moving on. 
the Montauk Monster. The Montauk Monster is, uh, it, it's this thing. Yeah, I'm not really sure where to go with this. On July 23rd, 2008, a 26-year-old woman named Jenna Hewitt was walking on the beach with several friends when they stumbled across a strange animal carcass in the sand. It was described as being nearly hairless and appeared to be heavily bruised with flesh missing from its face. The group joked that the creature could have come from the nearby Plum Island Animal Disease Center. Hewitt snapped a photo of it, which was run in the local newspaper. While much of the talk around the creature was very lighthearted and non-conspiratorial, others have speculated that the monster was in fact a mutant that escaped containment or an alien creature. This speculation would lead to the Montauk monster being passed around in the media, all while being given the conspiracy and urban legend treatment. It was mentioned on several TV shows, namely Conspiracy Theory with Jesse Ventura and... Ancient aliens. I just, I, I can't get away from it, can I? The SV Mary Celeste. The SV Mary Celeste was an American merchant ship that was found adrift and abandoned near the coast of Portugal in 1872. She was discovered by the De Gracia, a Canadian brigantine that was bound for Gibraltar. After being spotted moving erratically towards them, Captain David Morehouse suspected that something was wrong with the ship's crew. After not receiving a reply to his signals, Morehouse prepared a boarding party to investigate the ship. The sails were partially set. The rigging of the ship was heavily damaged, implying that it hadn't been tended to in days. The mount that contained the ship's compass was damaged, and several storage areas were found to be left open, with their unsecured covers nearby. The ropes connected to the lifeboat berth were cut, and the lifeboat was missing. Going inside, they found the crew quarters to be abandoned. Water had found its way into some of the cabins through the skylights, but were otherwise normal. Inside the captain's quarters, it was discovered that both the navigation instruments, as well as the ship's papers, were missing. Other personal effects were left behind as well. Below decks, there was about three and a half feet of water in the hold, which sounds like a problem, but is somewhat common for boats of this size. The galley was clean, and there were ample food stores left. In some accounts of the story, one member of the boarding party noticed a strong smell from the cargo hold, which was later determined to be its cargo of 1,701 barrels of industrial alcohol. Returning to the De Gracia, the crew decided to bring the Mary Celeste with them as a salvage claim. Despite encountering fog and slow progress, both ships made it to Gibraltar, and the Mary Celeste was impounded by the Admiralty to await her salvage hearing. While she was famous for her status as a ghost ship, the Mary Celeste was known by former crew as a notoriously unlucky ship. Originally, she was named the Amazon. Her first captain, a man named Robert McClellan, had fallen ill after beginning their maiden voyage and would die shortly after. Returning to port, a man named John Parker would take command and resume their voyage, only to collide with fishing equipment and sink another boat by ramming it. These unfortunate events are largely attributed to naval superstitions, which state that a death or accident during a ship's maiden voyage is a sign of horrible things to come. After being salvaged, the Mary Celeste had become something of a taboo vessel. No one wanted to take her out, and no one wanted to buy her for a reasonable price. Ultimately, the Mary Celeste was destroyed by her final owners in an insurance scam. After being loaded with cheap cargo, her crew overreported its value by quite a bit and crashed it into a shallow reef near Port-au-Prince, Haiti. While a court was keen to prosecute the crew, they could not agree on a verdict and settled on the crew withdrawing their claims and repaying their insurance money. However, the court's decision to not punish them was overruled, seemingly by fate. The captain, Gilman Parker, would die three months later, having been stricken with poverty after being released. Another crew member would develop insanity, and another would take his own life. The superstitious attribute their fates to the curse of the Mary Celeste, taking three more victims before finally coming to rest beneath the ocean waves. So while researching for this entry, I came across a pretty sound explanation, in my opinion, for how the uh, Mary Celeste ended up the way it did. Um, and I'm just going to kind of repeat that um, right now. So the explanation is basically 
that the crew of the Mary Celeste was hauling uh, industrial alcohol. And hauling alcohol can be a very um, divisive business. It's very combustible. And I'm thinking more than likely what happened is the fumes from the alcohol at one point may have caught fire from maybe something like a lantern or a cigarette. And that caused kind of like a brief, you know, kind of explosion that may have rocked open a couple of the portholes and in all likelihood that probably would have shaken the crew up quite a bit you know having an explosion on the boat that is in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean so what they did is they took the lifeboat on the Mary Celeste they put it in the water and they basically tied it to the side of the boat and the idea is that the crew would basically go into the lifeboat and they wouldn't really cast off but they would more kind of hang on to the side of the ship you know with a rope and just kind of trail along and see if the alcohol was going to be any more of a problem and so basically the crew they kind of tumble into the boat and the captain brings his navigation equipment um, and the ship's papers in case they have to actually cast off of the Mary Celeste if it starts burning and sinking. Um, that way, they have documentation that the ship was theirs and everything like that. And they have his navigation instruments, so they have a fighting way of getting to Portugal. Now, more than likely, what happened after this is at some point during this whole happening, the crew kind of piled their way onto the boat and as the boat is kind of moving along, the rope connecting the lifeboat to the Mary Celeste either snaps or is undone for some reason. And they basically just kind of float away from the Mary Celeste and leave it to its own devices. Now obviously, the ship didn't sink, so whatever the crew thought might have been wrong with the boat, it didn't turn out to be that big of an issue and it was intercepted by the De Gracia, and it was dragged into Gibraltar and all that, but the crew more than likely would have been lost at sea uh, in the lifeboat, you know, because at, at some point, you know, they probably ran out of food or they came across a storm and they just, you know, the boat couldn't handle it, and it ended up sinking and taking the crew with it. That's a little bit terrifying to think of, um, just kind of slowly watching your only hope of survival just drifting away, you know, lightly in the breeze or heavily in the breeze, depending on what the weather conditions were. I'm not sure. I thought it was interesting, um, and I think we're going to go ahead and move on to the next one. Killdozer. The Killdozer was a heavily modified Komatsu D355A bulldozer that was created by Marvin Hemeyer. According to some of those that knew him, Hemeyer was a friendly, talkative guy who'd give you the shirt off his back if you asked. He was a veteran in the Air Force who had a knack for welding and mechanical repair and enjoyed snowmobiling in his spare time. In 1991, he moved to the small town of Grand Lake, Colorado in order to start a muffler repair shop. His troubles began when he purchased a two-acre plot of land in the town of Granby at auction for $42,000. According to Hemeyer, he was accosted by successful Granby businessman Cody Docheff over the land that he'd bought and offered him a large sum of money for the property. Hemeyer was initially interested in the offer, but increased his price to the point that Docheff withdrew his offer. Shortly after, it came out that Hemeyer's septic system was not up to code. In order to fix this and connect to the city's sewage line, it was going to cost him nearly double what he had paid for the property. Believing he could find a cheaper alternative, Hemeyer relented for the moment and focused on another issue that had arisen. Across the way from him, the Dochefs were in the midst of constructing a concrete plant. Hemeyer was opposed to this plant, claiming that its presence would overcrowd the road that his customers used and create a large amount of dust and noise. During this construction, a parcel of property to the south was purchased by the Dochefs and rezoned without Hemeyer's knowledge. When he attempted to appeal this usage, Hemeyer discovered that because 30 days had passed since the zoning was completed, it was now legal and unappealable. Additionally, the property overlapped with the direct path towards the city's sewer main, meaning that in order to hook up his out-of-code septic system, Hemeyer would need to seek an easement from the Dochefs. 
It also gave the Doe Chefs control of the road that was used to access his muffler shop. This enraged Hemeyer, who was not keen to seek approval from the family that had been holding his hands to the fire, so to speak. He began a public awareness campaign surrounding the concrete plant, and leveled a lawsuit at the city of Granby for the perceived wrongdoings of the Dochefs. Both efforts began strong, but were ultimately defeated when the Dochefs promised to address the issues brought to light in the awareness campaign, and a Colorado court found Hemeyer in violation of city code for a septic system. With his efforts appearing wasted, Hemeyer was devastated. After taking a trip to California, he purchased the Komatsu D355A at auction for $16,000. After trying unsuccessfully to create a new road to his garage using the bulldozer, Hemeyer parked it near his property and posted it with a for sale sign. When no one showed interest in buying it, he decided that it was a sign from God to begin a mission that would make all who wronged him pay for what they had done. Over the course of a year and a half, Hemeyer would modify the bulldozer to carry out his revenge. He completely sealed the driver's seat in an armored capsule, using video cameras connected to monitors inside in place of windows. He fitted the sides with fixed gun ports, which utilized a Barrett M82A1 50 caliber rifle, an FNFAL chambered in 308, and a Ruger Mini-14 in 5.56. He also stashed several handguns inside, as well as enough food and water to last him one week. On the afternoon of June 4th, 2004, Hemeyer would seal himself inside of the killdozer, preventing access in or out. 911, what's your emergency? Uh, this is Jerry of the Trash Company. Uh -huh. And there is a bulldozer over about Kirby Concrete destroying their building. It's destroying the building? Okay, yeah. is anyone on it? Yeah, it's all encased in metal, and you can't see who's driving or anything. They can't get it to stop. The first target of his rampage was, predictably, the Dochef's concrete plan across the way. He effortlessly demolished the main building while the Dochefs and their staff tried unsuccessfully to engage the killdozer, even trying to stop it with another front loader of comparable size. A short time later, sheriff deputies arrived on scene, but were also powerless to stop the massive machine. Despite their best efforts, the killdozer was seemingly impervious to damage. The thick steel armor plating was unaffected by small arms fire. At one point, an officer climbed on top of the dozer and dropped a flashbang grenade down the exhaust pipe to try and disable it, but it kept on going. Hemeyer continued to drive through the town, destroying multiple buildings along the way, including Granby Town Hall, the Liberty Savings Bank, Sky High News, Mountain Parks Electric, and several buildings owned by Thompson Excavating. It was discovered during his rampage that all of these businesses were connected to those that had clashed with Hemeyer during his 13 years of business in Granby. After unsuccessfully trying to destroy a yard of propane tanks with his M82 using incendiary rounds, he proceeded to attack the Gamble Hardware Store. On the way, he was met with an earth scraper from the Grand County Road Department that tried to block him, but he simply pushed it out of the way. He also sustained damage to his radiator, which created a large cloud of smoke. After beginning to demolish the hardware store, Hemeyer would meet his match. Unbeknownst to him, there was a basement beneath the store, which his right tread would fall through, causing him to get stuck. Bottomed out and unable to move out of the store, and with his engine barely clinging to life, Hemeyer would shut off the killdozer and allow the police to cordon off the alley in which he had come to a stop. As deputies and a newly arrived SWAT team prepared for a gunfight against Hemeyer, they would report hearing a single, muted shot from the inside of the killdozer. Despite having their suspicions, they would need to confirm them by opening the armored capsule. Three explosive breaching charges did no damage to the armor plating, so the choice was made to use an oxyacetylene torch to cut the armor open. After getting inside, suspicions were confirmed when they found Hemeyer's lifeless body in the driver's seat of the killdozer. He had taken his own life with a 357 Magnum that was found on the floor. Authorities would remove his body at 2 a.m. on June 5th. Man, that is one hell of a story. Uh, damn, the plight of Marvin Hemeyer is one that has been heavily scrutinized um, ever since 2004 when it happened. I will say one of the most interesting aspects of this whole story 
it's just the amount of you know points of view that i think have to be considered you've got a lot of people on one hand who condemn he meyer for you know doing what he did and taking out his anger and frustration on the town of granby and then you've got people on the other side who you know damn near idolize he meyer and what he did um as just the perfect like you know nice guy being pushed to the edge you know the guy that took matters into his own hands when no one else would help him or give him a break and while i definitely agree that what happened to him just reeks of small town politics I still think he had a way out that didn't involve the destruction of Granby, Colorado. And I say that because before he started construction on the Killdozer, he actually sold both his muffler shop and the property that it was on for a very nice profit, okay? The land alone he sold for $400,000. So, you know, 42 grand evolving over time into 400,000. I mean, that's almost a tenfold profit. So, he would be eating pretty good if he just took his assets and just left to start a new life elsewhere, away from the prying eyes of, of Granby and all of these, you know, stupid small town politics that he'd become a victim of. And I guess a large reason as to why he didn't leave was because of his pride. I mean, at a certain point, I feel like a lot of people would be inclined to stay and to see something like this through. I mean, they spent the last 13 years keeping him down and, you know, consistently, I mean, putting him to the side and, and ignoring his point of view. And then, you know, past a certain point, it'd be hard to kind of walk away from that with your pride intact. But I mean, what do I know? You know, I've never been in a situation like that. I've never been really ganged up on or, or bullied to the point that I felt the need to retaliate in that sense. So I guess I just kind of, you know, have to to, to stay back and, and act as a spectator, like kind of the rest of us. There are probably very few people in the world who know exactly how he Meyer felt. And I guess that's just kind of where I'm gonna have to leave it. Operation High Jump. Operation High Jump was a U.S. Navy operation that began in 1946 and ended a year later. The purpose was to establish a permanent base on the continent of Antarctica and determine the feasibility of future operations there. The operation was assembled and led by Rear Admiral Richard E. Byrd, a fierce man who had explored Antarctica on multiple occasions prior to this. Ultimately, the operation was a success and paved the way for future U.S. expansion in the region. However, Operation High Jump has been theorized to be much more important than a simple trip to the Antarctic. Some connect the events of High Jump to rumors of secret outposts being constructed by Nazi Germany during the height of their power. These outposts supposedly contained advanced aircraft that would have turned the tide of the war in Germany's favor, but were not ready to be used. Some of these theories postulate the High Jump Task Force was meant to confront these Nazi remnants and confiscate their advanced tech for the US. As for other theories, well, we have something that's even crazier. At some point after his death, Admiral Richard Byrd's son procured a diary that apparently belonged to his father. Within, he found a great deal of confusing information that seems to contradict the current record. In this diary, Byrd claims to have discovered a large hole in the ground which, upon flying into, gave way to a lush jungle cave. At the end of this cave, he then describes witnessing a city of crystalline buildings inhabited by giant people. Immediately after, he writes that his plane was suddenly plucked out of the sky and set on the ground by a group of strange hovering craft. These giant people then spoke to him and warned Bird about the growing threat of atomic weapons to human civilization and hoped they would avert further conflicts for all their sakes. Unsurprisingly, this account directly connects with the legend of Agartha, the mythical subterranean city that houses advanced technology and aliens. So I don't know if this is on purpose, but the conspiracy portions of Operation High Jump, they've more or less been completely scrubbed from official sources on the internet. Like, it's not even present on the Wikipedia page, you know, mentioning all of the other aspects about this 
uh, case. And I guess when you actually sit down and look at the theories <laughs> that they're proposing, it's kind of understandable why these wouldn't even be mentioned in the official record. Like, it just seems kind of ridiculous that, you know, Admiral Byrd, this straight shooter, you know, Antarctic explorer, he would just see a hole in the ground and immediately he'd be like, let's fly into it. it like, how would he even know if there's like an exit on the other side? Yeah, I just don't really see any way of that actually happening. As far as um, his journal that his son reportedly found, um, the journal has never been like officially confirmed as being real, aside from like once, and I, I couldn't even find like the reference to like who checked it or whatnot, so I, I can't confirm if the journal is real or not. I, I don't think it's real. Uh, considering that one of my sources for this uh, entry was an ancient alien snippet, I, I think it's safe to assume that it's it's not real. It's fake. So I think we're going to go ahead and move on to the next entry. Body Doubles Body Doubles is a conspiracy theory surrounding the replacement of important figures with lookalikes for a variety of reasons. It's commonly relayed in the political space, usually in reference to controversial figures who may face harm in a public space, like the Clintons, Donald Trump, or Vladimir Putin. Body Doubles also come up in conspiracies surrounding the replacement of people in the wake of their death or disappearance. A theory postulating that Paul McCartney of the Beatles is actually a body double has maintained popularity since coming around in the 1960s. The Enfield Hauntings the Enfield Poltergeist was a series of claims made by the Hodgson family of paranormal activity at their home on 284 Green Street. As the story goes, in 1977, Peggy Hodgson calls the police to her house after hearing an unexplained knocking on the walls of her home. Officers would report a chair being moved and could not identify how it might have done so. For the next 18 months, continual reports of paranormal activity in the house were made by the Hodgsons, their neighbors, and paranormal investigators. These reports of activity include furniture moving, objects being thrown by an unknown force, an angry voice accompanied by knocking on the walls, and even reports of Peggy's young daughters levitating. Famously, the latter phenomenon was reported to have been caught in a photograph as seen here. Understandably, many have been skeptical of the reports and say the evidence as to their existence is lackluster. The hauntings ceased in 1979 and have not been reported on since. The story has been adapted into media several times, most famously, The Conjuring 2. Oh, the uh, Enfield haunting. Um, d do I even really need to say it? There is no way to prove that anything happened in that house whatsoever. Like, the most notorious piece of evidence, like this photo, it can be recreated in like two seconds. Here, I I'll do it. I'll do it right now. Are you watching? It's it's gonna be real quick, but there, you see? You see how easy it was to do that? And look at me, I'm fine. No poltergeists in here? I'm just living it up. Overall, just kind of an underwhelming uh, example of a paranormal encounter, um, but trust me, we will be seeing some better examples later on in the iceberg, so don't worry. The ghosts are coming. They'll, they'll get here. They'll get here soon. Uh, let's go ahead and move on to the next one. Y2K Y2K, also known as the Year 2000 problem, was a computer programming bug that is considered one of the most overstated issues ever. Y2K was made possible through an oversight in the early days of computers. Back then, core memory cost as much as $1 per bit, and data processing was still conducted using punched cards, which were limited in how much they could store. Therefore, bit conservation was made a priority, which led to programmers cutting data wherever it was not explicitly required. One of these cuts was with date logging. Instead of displaying all four digits of the current year, they cut the first two to save data. 
At the time, it was considered to be a foolproof, obvious cut that was rolled out into many systems and programs. The first people to notice Y2K were engineers who developed genealogical software. Because dates were abbreviated using the last two digits, dates in the previous century were unable to be cataloged correctly, which caused a multitude of problems. By extension, dates in the next millennium, 2000, would be similarly difficult to catalog if the problem was not addressed. However, this problem was mostly ignored by programmers, who pretty much looked at the date and said, Yeah, I've got time. As the years crawled by, engineers continued to pass the buck on fixing Y2K and pretty much ignored it. Although when they finally began looking into it in the mid-1990s, they did not like what they saw. Once people sat down and began looking at the potential havoc Y2K could wreak, they were scared. Some predicted that GPS satellites, many of which used these outdated programs, would immediately cease functioning and take away all the systems that relied on them. That meant international flights, boat navigation, weather systems, financial trading, gas pumps, basically everything modern society relied on. To many, it seemed like Y2K could mean the end of the world as we knew it, and the media was not in a hurry to correct them either. Many companies advertised Y2K survival kits, which included things like heirloom seeds, dehydrated food, and portable toilets. Sales of firearms and survival equipment increased substantially as well, as many anticipated the world to fall into chaos when the new year came. Some even had full ham survival bunkers constructed, like 1960s fallout shelter Vault 101 level dwellings. On January 31st, a few people experienced bugs stemming from Y2K ahead of schedule. Tensions were high, people sheltered in their homes, others held signs for all to see, pigs were flying, it was crazy. And when the dates rolled over, there was... Uh... Well... Not a whole lot of anything worth noting, actually. Sure, some computer systems displayed the wrong dates, and subway terminals didn't accept your card sometimes, which was annoying, but nothing else super crazy happened. Planes didn't fall out of the sky, our power grids didn't shut off, and banks didn't forget all your money either. The brokerage industry had actually started addressing Y2K back in the 80s, so many assets on Wall Street barely broke stride when the dates rolled over. Also, private companies had been independently submitting Y2K fixes into computer software all over the world as part of their regular update schedule for years at that point. Overall, it's just become one of those events that people look at in retrospect as something along the lines of mass hysteria. So just like a quick little interjection here before we move on to the next one. Um, Y2K actually has a sequel, um, and it's not that far away. It is the Y2K38 problem, um, which is slated to affect Unix systems on January 19th, 2038. I believe it has something to do with the amount of like possible integer combinations like going over a certain amount or like resetting. Um, I'm not really sure uh, how that's all going to work out. I haven't researched it a whole lot beyond just like, you know, skimming the article. I guess I just wanted to let you know that there are a few more reasons to be scared of your computer shutting off in the future. So, um, yeah, let's go ahead and move on to the next one. North Sentinel Island. North Sentinel Island is located in the Andaman Archipelago and is home to the Sentinelese tribe one of the last voluntarily isolated pockets of human civilization. The Sentinelese are observed to be quite primitive, using bows and spears to hunt game. They also harvest seafood from the coral reefs surrounding the island using canoes. However, they are unique from other tribal groups due to their use of metal in their tools, which they've salvaged from various shipwrecks near the island. They are thought to have been descended from, or at least heavily influenced by the Onga people, as the two groups share numerous similarities in material customs and lifestyle. Over the years, there have been numerous contacts with the Sentinelese, most of which have ended in hostilities. Because of the risks associated with the island and the fear that introduction of disease could wipe out the tribals, the Indian government established a 3km exclusion zone around North Sentinel Island in 1956 which is enforced by an armed patrol. 
If one were to visit the island, they would need special authorization from the government and an armed escort to ensure the visitor's safety. But in 2018, North Sentinel Island was thrust into the international limelight after a 26-year-old Christian missionary named John Allen Chow attempted to make contact with the Sentinelese. His goal was to preach Christianity to the local tribe in an effort to conquer Satan's final stronghold on behalf of all nations, a Christian organization based in Kansas City, Missouri. Unsurprisingly, the Sentinelese reacted negatively to Chow's presence on the island. He was chased away twice and was shot at with arrows. He would record his interactions with the tribe in his journal, which was recovered by authorities. On his third and final trip, he instructed the fishermen who had transported him to abandon him on the shore. The following day, they returned out of concern that Chow was out of his depth. They would witness members of the tribe dragging his dead body around the beach, apparently having shot him with arrows. A short while later, they would bury his body. Indian authorities would arrest the fishermen who transported Chow to the island. An effort was made to recover his body, but was abandoned after the risk of a violent confrontation was deemed to be too great. I Feel Fantastic I Feel Fantastic is a viral video that was posted to YouTube in 2009 by a user named Creepyblog. The video is just over two and a half minutes long, and depicts an animatronic girl named Tara singing a song in a monotone electronic voice. Machín, ya llegó la rótula. Hay que pagarla. ¿Cuánto vale qué? Initially, the video gained infamy as being unsettling and creepy, with many on YouTube posting their reactions and theories about where the video came from and what it meant. Eventually, the video was traced back to a man named John Bergeron. In 2001, Bergeron proposed Tara to the internet as a do-it-all android that had entertainment, research, and security applications. At some point in 2004, he rebranded her as a musical entertainer and marketed a DVD of Tara singing for a small fee. The creepy blog video is a snippet from the 16 minute video contained on that DVD. Thunderbirds Thunderbirds are legendary Native American creatures that are considered to be extremely powerful. These beasts are said to resemble massive birds that are capable of creating thunder and storms with the flap of their wings. They are depicted in multiple Native American groups, namely the Algonquins, Siouxans, and Arikaras. During the westward expansion of the U.S., settlers and cowboys would come into contact with the myth and claim to see the creature watching them off in the distance. At one point in 1890, a newspaper out of the small town of Tombstone, Arizona, published an interesting article. In short, multiple men claimed to have shot down a strange winged monster that defied normal explanation. According to them, they then carted the creature back into town, where it was nailed against a local man's barn with its wings outstretched. Onlookers were shocked by its sheer size, reporting that it was measured at 160 feet wide, constituting 78 feet per wing. There were also reports of a photo being taken as proof, which shows the men stretching their arms out so as to provide a sense of scale. Some people claim to have seen this photo and attest to its existence in magazines and other old media. The description varies between people, with some maintaining its appearance to that of a large hawk or eagle, while others claim it was more reptile-esque, sporting a long head and beak with arched scaly wings and a long tail. From this description, some have theorized the Thunderbird to be a surviving pterosaur, which refers to the clade of flying dinosaurs that were alive from the Triassic period to the Cretaceous period. Obviously, this is extremely difficult to believe, as most of the dinosaurs, along with most terrestrial life, were killed during the KPG extinction event roughly 65 million years ago. Also, even though some avian dinosaurs survived, it is insurmountable that they maintain their species' genetic identity into the modern age. 
but some believe nonetheless. So like most uh, myths and legends, I believe that Thunderbirds are somewhat rooted uh, in reality. I believe that Thunderbirds are probably inspired by, you know, a lot of the large bird species that you encounter um, out in the plains and in, you know, California and Arizona. Things like the turkey vulture, uh, the California condor, I mean, these birds can get pretty big. Um, we're talking huge wingspans, like up to 10 feet. Uh, in the case of the California condor. As for the article out of uh, Tombstone, Arizona, um, I think that the photograph that was supposedly included with that is actually a candidate of the Mandela effect. Because a lot of people report uh, seeing this photograph at one point or believing that they saw it, but at one point they actually located the original newspaper that had the article in it, and when they took a look at it, and this was like a real, you know, complete copy, no snips, no anything, um, there wasn't a picture attached to the article. So apparently the descriptions of the article having a photo attached were just completely incorrect. Other than that, I think Thunderbirds are definitely an interesting concept. I always like hearing about um, Native American folklore and a lot of the nature-inspired deities that they incorporate and weave uh, into their mythos and legends. Um, I just find it really interesting, and I think we're going to go ahead and move on to the next one. Sky King Sky King is the nickname given to Richard Bebo Russell, a 29-year-old Horizon Air ground service worker who is employed at SeaTac International Airport. On August 10th, 2018, Russell hijacked a DeHalavan DHC-8 passenger plane and performed an unauthorized takeoff at 7.32 p.m. After attempting to contact the plane multiple times, ATC would report the takeoff and begin tracking the plane. As this was happening, two F-15C Eagles from the Oregon Air National Guard's 142nd Fighter Wing would be scrambled to intercept the plane and, if necessary, shoot it down. After taking off, Russell would finally respond to ATC and maintained a friendly, if not slightly absurd, conversation with the operator as he flew the plane. Did you just take off? Yeah. And you're not supposed to be on that aircraft? Uh, no. Yeah, I just kind of want to do a couple maneuvers to see what it can do before I put it down, you know? I'm sorry, say that again? Sorry, uh, my mic came, came off. I threw up a little bit. Uh, you know, I, uh, hold on. Ah, shoot. Man, I'm sorry about this. I hope this doesn't ruin your day. I got a lot of people that care about me, and, uh, it's gonna disappoint them to, to you that I did this. Um, I would like to apologize to each and every one of them. Um, just a broken guy. Got a few screws loose, I guess. Never really knew it <clears throat> until now. Um, just, you know, I think I'm, uh, I'm going to try to do a barrel roll. And if that goes good, now I'm just going to nose down and call it a night. Towards the end of his flight, he performed a barrel roll and recovered the plane a mere 10 feet above the surface of the Puget Sound. A professional pilot would comment that the maneuver was executed well and that Russell clearly had some talent behind the stick. After the ATC operator continued to insist that he land the plane after performing that extremely dangerous stunt, Russell would unfortunately confirm what many had begun to think. All right, ah, uh, damn it, I don't know, man, I don't know. I don't want to, I was kind of hoping that was gonna be it, you know? Shortly after this exchange ended, Russell would stay true to his word. He would maneuver over to the sparsely populated Ketron Island and angle down into the ground. He did not survive the crash. The subsequent fuel fire consumed about two acres of forest land, but was quickly contained. The FBI quickly ruled out any terrorist motives during their investigation and concluded that Russell had acted alone. The flight data recorder was recovered and sent to the NTSB and FAA for analysis. What has remained a mystery, however, was how Russell learned to fly without ever receiving any training. It's been theorized, as well as outright stated by him, that Russell had trained himself using flight simulator video games, 
as well as talking with pilots on the tarmac while he was moving their planes. There have been multiple witnesses who saw Russell speaking with flight crew in the cockpit of planes while pointing at the instrument panels. I personally believe that he accomplished this through a combination of both. Regardless of how he accomplished what he did, Richard Russell's plight was circulated online as a tragic story of circumstance and mental health that culminated in a final grandiose display. Memes and heartfelt posts were made about him, and he was dubbed the Sky King due to his talent in the air. Many felt for him and his family, who have consistently repeated that they never saw his death coming. So a fact about me, um, if I haven't made this clear already, I actually live in the Pacific Northwest, uh, near Seattle, and I actually remember seeing uh, stories about the Sky King on the day that it happened. That was a very strange day. Um, I'll admit, I don't think I fully grasped um, the severity of the situation back then. I think I just thought that it was cool that some dude just like took a plane for a joyride and whatever. But knowing a little bit more um, about what Richard Russell was going through and hearing the audio between him and the air traffic controller, um, it, it definitely gives this event a whole new perspective. It just makes you think that like, you know, life is just very, I guess you could say life is kind of, you know, incongruous at times. You know, you're not really sure what shape it's going to take, what form it's in currently, if it's even tangible. I mean, in the case of Richard Russell, you know, he had a wife, he probably had a lot of people that loved him, and for him to decide, you know, today's my final day, I'm gonna climb into that plane, I'm gonna fly around until I, uh, until I decide to go nose down. It, it makes you think. Um, and I guess, you know, all I can say is my condolences to his family and to everyone who was affected by this. And if there's anybody that, you know, you haven't checked on in a while, you know, maybe just give him a call, give him a text, you know. It, it never hurts, you know, it never hurts to just check in and see how things are going. So I think we're going to go ahead and move on to the next one. Man. Face on Mars The face on Mars is a strange photo taken by the Viking 1 Mars Orbiter, which appears to capture a human face on the surface of the Red Planet. The photo gained brief traction from conspiracy theorists as proof of extraterrestrials on Mars, who were either attempting to get our attention or had built a monolithic structure in their own image. This was quickly debunked by officials who released several new images of the same area under different lighting conditions that showed its true shape. This is undoubtedly a case of human pattern recognition seeing something that we recognize as a face, but is not. It's the same thing as seeing a face in the trees or the clouds. It looks like something's there, but it's merely an illusion caused by a quirk of nature. The Great Pokemon War the Great Pokemon War is a very interesting theory slash inference about the Pokemon series, more specifically the first lineup of games released in 1996. But before we get into the specifics, we should clarify some things about the games. First and foremost, Pokemon is designed to be played by kids. Because of this, many themes in the series have been toned down for the sake of its target audience. Actual violence is heavily censored, being limited to intense verbal altercations, and physical battles being fought through Pokemon duels by proxy. Carrying even further, Pokemon are unable to be physically killed. They simply faint after sustaining too much damage. They are then brought to the Pokemon Center and nursed back to full health in a matter of seconds. However, this theory presents enough evidence to, in my opinion, jeopardize this positive logic and show a different, darker side of the Pokemon games that was previously reserved for creepypastas and urban legends. A significant portion of this theory stems from the character Lieutenant Surge, the third gym leader in the Kanto region. When you first encounter Surge, he makes a comment that is somewhat revealing. While the subtleties change from game to game, he more or less says that challenging him is foolish as he is the best when it comes to electric Pokemon. He then states that his electric Pokemon saved him during the war 
and that he will zap you into submission slash surrender. First, there's the implications of a grown man saying that to a 10 year old. Uh, poor choice of words, man. Second, Surge's implication that his Pokemon saved his life. Well, it denotes that his service in the military was spent in a combat zone where his Pokemon were active participants. From what we now know, we can infer that there was, at one point, an active war in the Pokemon universe, one that had lethal implications. Extending beyond this, it also explains why there are very few men in the Kanto region, namely the protagonist's father and the rival's parents. During wartime, it is common for eligible men to be called into service, either through patriotic duty or propaganda, or through a draft. Depending on the outcome as of the game's continuity, it's possible that the war is either still ongoing or resulted in severe losses. This is a similar plight to that of the Lost Generation, who came of age during World War I. Millions of young men thrust themselves into combat, only to be killed en masse by the trappings of modern warfare. It was said that entire villages were left devoid of young men after the war ended, which left quite the impact on those who were left to rebuild. So this is one of those theories that just keeps getting crazier <laughs> the more you think about it and the more you put things into that context. I mean, for me, I started thinking about just the lethal implications of certain Pokemon. I mean, like Charizard or Rhydon or, or God forbid, something like Mewtwo or like Dragonite or something. And then you imagine like, how would, how would a human fight that? Are you just gonna shoot it with a gun? Do you have to like do something else? Or do you have to just fight it with other Pokemon? Like how much of this war is fought using the Pokemon and how much of this war is fought using the humans? Like is it like a fairly equal trade or are they just constantly like warring out the Pokemon? It just makes you think about like how organized warfare would work in the context of like a modern military. And then to like take another like severe right turn you've got like the pokemon teams and it, you might know what i'm talking about already but you've got these teams in the games that you know like team rocket you know team aqua team magma galactic you know these teams in the games that serve as like the antagonists like the overarching bad guys who want to like do the bad thing or whatever to the legendary pokemon on the cover and at that point you just kind of see those teams for what they are in this context and they are essentially perpetuating pokemon assisted terrorism which like then you reframe a bunch of terrorist attacks in the frame of what could happen if a pokemon did it this is just so weird to think about it's i don't know man i didn't set out to like completely ruin my perspective on the Pokemon games. I'm sorry if I ruined yours too, but God, this is just so, so interesting to think about. I mean like ditto? Oh my God, don't even, don't even get me started on the implications of ditto, man. Ditto in a war? Like he could just turn into like a gun. <laughs> it's like Oh my god, I'm getting too deep. I'm getting too deep. Um, another thing to kind of just, you know, to, to kind of round us out away from the terrorist Pokemon, away from the military Pokemon, um, apparently Lieutenant Surge is American. I guess that doesn't even really contribute to the theory. That's just kind of like a, an obscure fact that you as a Pokemon fan might know. But this also implies that there are other countries in the Pokemon universe that are real, that are tangible. So, I don't know. I just thought this whole theory was extremely interesting, and I figured that I'd share it. Anyways, uh, I think we're gonna go ahead and move on now to the next one. It's not even that hot. Johnny Gosh. Johnny Ghosh was a 12-year-old paperboy who disappeared without a trace. 
On September 5th, 1982, Ghosh arrived at the Des Moines Register paper drop with his dog, Gretchen, shortly before his disappearance. He grabbed his papers and proceeded on his route. This is the last sighting that can be effectively corroborated by more than one individual. According to a man named John Rossi, he witnessed a boy he identified as Ghosh talking to a man in a blue car. He said that something felt strange and decided to insert himself into the situation. Ghosh would then tell Rossi that the man had only asked him for directions, which satisfied Rossi. A short while later, another paperboy reported seeing Ghosh being followed by a man, while another neighbor reported hearing a door slam and seeing a silver Ford Fairmont speed away quickly. At 6am, Johnny's parents, Noreen and John Ghosh, received calls from various people that their papers had not been delivered, which prompted both of them to begin searching the neighborhood for their son. A short time later, they found his wagon about two blocks from their home, still full of papers. They immediately reported their son missing, but to their dismay had to wait nearly 45 minutes before an officer would take the report. At first, the police assumed that Ghosh was simply a runaway and would turn up in the afternoon no worse for wear. However, it quickly became clear that Johnny was not coming back, and the police began to investigate. After a little while, they were unable to establish a clear motive as to why Ghosh would be kidnapped, and made no arrests or named any suspects. To this day, there have been no substantial leads on Ghosh's whereabouts or status. In addition to being one of the most talked about disappearances at the time, Ghosh was also one of the first missing children to be featured on a milk carton as part of an ad campaign by Anderson Erickson Dairy. Ghosh's disappearance also assisted in the creation of the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children by the U.S. Congress and the Johnny Ghosh Bill, which mandates immediate police response in the event of a child's disappearance. So on the official side of things, um, this case seems to kind of end where it starts. Um, the police weren't able to pick up a lot of leads in regards to where Johnny went. However, it would appear that uh, Noreen Ghosh, so Johnny's mother, um, has had a few developments in the case uh, since it was shelved by authorities. Apparently, in 1997, uh, Noreen Ghosh claims to have been visited by her son, a man who claimed to be Johnny, showed up uh, at her doorstep with another man, um, for seemingly no reason whatsoever. Um, the man identified himself as Johnny by opening his shirt and showing Noreen a birthmark that apparently Johnny had, um, and she immediately believed him. He then proceeds to tell Noreen a story um, about where he had been, and according to this older Johnny, he was abducted and put into a human trafficking ring, and eventually he was released when he was deemed to be too old, so they apparently just let him go. After about an hour and a half of talking to Noreen, uh, both of them just left, and as far as I can tell, that is the long and short of it. While Noreen Ghosh believes without a shadow of a doubt that this was her son, um, a lot of other people are not exactly on her same page. Johnny's father actually doubts such an encounter took place, um, they actually split a little while after Johnny went missing, and he believes that Noreen is grasping for answers because she never really got over the disappearance of her son. Um, she just couldn't accept that he disappeared without a trace, and so in order to kind of, I guess, relieve her mind, she ultimately made up this event uh, in which, you know, Johnny comes to her door, he comes home, and, you know, finally they get a chance to talk, and that kind of served as closure for her, almost. Whether or not it actually happened, I'm not really sure. Um, I just thought this case was interesting, and I thought I'd put it on the iceberg. So, I think we're gonna go ahead and move on to the next one. Hitler Lives Hitler Lives is the controversial theory that Nazi dictator Adolf Hitler did not kill himself on April 30th, 1945. Instead, it insists that he and other important members of his cabinet exfiltrated the Fuhrer bunker under the Reich Chancellery in Berlin through unknown means. 
and evaded capture by fleeing the country. Perpetrators of this theory state that the circumstances of Hitler's death are extremely suspicious and offer plenty of discrepancies that are not easily explainable. For example, Hitler's suicide was directly witnessed by no one else but his wife, Eva Braun, who died shortly after him due to cyanide poisoning. It's been stated that Hitler's final wishes were to place both him and his wife's bodies in a bomb crater and douse them in petrol, so as to cremate himself and deny the Soviets his body as a trophy. After capturing the Reich Chancellery, Soviet troops recovered Hitler's ashes and a dental bridge that confirmed his identity. Beyond this, the Soviets have been seemingly reluctant to confirm that the remains were indeed Hitler's. They would issue an official death certificate in 1956, a full 11 years after he had supposedly died. This lengthy process has been attributed to a thorough investigation, which collected testimony from over 42 witnesses. While these facts do seem quite compelling, many theories falter as to how Hitler managed to escape Berlin while it was under siege. Some point to tunnel networks that had been constructed during Hitler's rise to power as an egress point, as well as various active U-boats that could have transported him over the ocean undetected. From there, theories posit that Hitler took refuge in Argentina, similar to many other Nazis post-war. There, they were given protection by Juan Perón, an important figure in the military government and future president of the country. Others state that he may have hidden out in Spain, though the latter theory appears to be taken more seriously among the public. Submechanophobia Submechanophobia is characterized as a fear of human-made objects that are partially or completely submerged in water. While this implies that anything human-made can be the object of the phobia, the most common examples are shipwrecks, buoys, statues, chains, and submarines. Oh, God, I fucking hate that so much. Those who have studied submechanophobia and related fears like thalassophobia have theorized that it's triggered by seeing a foreign object in a predominantly natural environment, which provokes a fight or flight response to seeing something outside the norm of where they're located. Well, uh, I had something of a sneaking suspicion uh, before all this, but after researching for this entry, I am pretty sure that I have a pretty bad case of submechanophobia. Just, you know, going through Google images. Yeah, I, I didn't like it. I didn't like it one bit. I think the theory about um, seeing a object uh, in a place where it shouldn't be, that is absolutely what I feel triggers my submechanophobia. The things that get me the worst are the new shipwrecks. Okay, the new shipwrecks. I'm talking like kind of the ones in like murky water where it's like it's just like a yacht that might have like sunk in the bay and like it's still white. It still looks new. It's just like you took a ship out of the marina and just put it on the bottom of the ocean. I hate those. It Oof. Uh, I, I can't, I can't think about this. We, we need to keep moving on. 2016 Clown Hysteria The 2016 Clown Hysteria was a brief, albeit potent case of mass hysteria stemming from a rapid increase in killer clown sightings. While the concept of a killer clown has been present in pop culture for a while, the phenomenon seemed to come to a head in August of 2016, when reports of clown sightings began popping up across the U.S. According to witnesses, the sightings were brief but unnerving. Some even described the clown as being predatory in nature, offering passing children money or candy if they went with them into the woods. Despite dispatching police to the locations, the perpetrator was never caught. As it would turn out, all of these sightings were part of a viral marketing stunt for a short film called Gags, which was about a killer clown of the same name. The director, a man named Adam Cross, took responsibility for the event and thanked everyone on the internet who had been sharing the sightings everywhere for making his promotion as popular as it was. Unfortunately, it seems like a great deal of people didn't get the memo to go and do something else as the sightings continued to increase, not just in volume, but severity as well. In the US alone, 12 arrests were made in relation to clown sightings, 
Additionally, a 16-year-old boy was stabbed and killed by an attacker reported to have worn a clown mask. All the while, social media continued to drive traffic and popularity to the trend, which was quickly reaching a breaking point. Police and businesses had started to take action, cracking down on clown-related offenders with harsher penalties, and removing clown masks and costumes from store shelves. This seemed to help the craze die down, but it threatened to return in October of that year when rumors of a quote-unquote clown purge spread across the US. Thankfully, reports of this clown purge seemed to be over-exaggerated, and things seemed to return to normal afterwards. However, two men in Florida were attacked by a group of teenagers on Halloween. The teens were wearing clown masks inspired from the Purge movies. One of the men was stabbed and the other was beaten with a hockey stick. Both men survived, but were shaken up and commented that they were thankful the attack was not more severe. Alright folks, it's that time once again. We are on the final entry of the third layer. As is tradition, I've got something with a bit more substance to kind of round us out. And this one is a little bit unique because it actually challenges a belief that I currently hold. So let's go ahead and get into it. The Sierra Tapes. The Sierra Sounds are a notorious set of recordings that appear to capture sounds and linguistic communication between creatures that have been identified as examples of Sasquatch. In 1971, a man named Ron Moorhead was invited out on a camping trip by a friend of his named Al Berry. This camping trip would involve traveling over eight miles into the Sierra Mountain wilderness on horseback to an area that Barry and his two other friends called the Sierra Camp. After reaching the camp, Moorhead would fall in love with this particular area of wilderness. It was isolated, beautiful, and a great hunting spot. Overall, it was an outdoorsman's heaven, and Moorhead lauded it as such. However, his love for the Sierra Camp would be tempered by a perplexing and terrifying encounter. Later that year, Moorhead, Barry, and the others would travel back to the Sierra camp and spend a few days there. After returning from a fruitful hunting trip, the men sat around the fire and talked with one another. It was dark, and the crackle of the fire echoed in the trees. At some point, they heard a strange grunting noise coming from somewhere in the woods. Believing that a bear was going to stumble across their campsite, they readied their guns and listened to confirm the direction they heard it from. That's when they heard a single loud whooping noise. The men realized all at once that they were not dealing with a bear and quickly retreated into their shelter. Straining to listen, they made out another whooping noise, this time coming from a different direction. To them, it seemed like two creatures were communicating with each other, with one making a discernibly different whoop than the first. Before long, the men would describe hearing these creatures running towards their camp at a steady pace. They kept their guns at the ready. Soon, the creatures found their way to the edge of the camp and began speaking in a language that sounded human. Moorhead would describe it as a poor imitation of a human language, consisting of guttural noises and grunts but nonetheless in a patterned, rhythmic delivery that you would expect from a foreign language you've never heard before. After hours of listening to these creatures, they finally exited the perimeter of the camp and gave the men a moment of reprieve. As soon as the sun came up, the men packed their things and promptly left the area. For a while, all of the men stayed away from the Sierra camp and wanted nothing to do with the strange creatures they had encountered in the woods that night. That is, all of them except for Ron Moorhead. Moorhead became convinced that what they had heard that night wasn't something they should avoid, but rather document. He eventually convinced Al Berry and the other two men to return to Sierra Camp, but with more equipment and a plan to gather proof of these strange creatures. After hiking into the Sierra Camp once again, the men sat and waited for these creatures to return. The most important piece of equipment that Moorhead brought with him was an audio tape recorder. This would allow him to capture the strange sounds made by these creatures, 
and potentially help them identify whatever was out there. Shortly after sunset, the men would hear the familiar sound of steady footsteps coming towards the camp. Just like last time, they retreated into their shelter and readied their weapons. In addition, Moorhead turned on his tape recorder to capture the approach of these creatures. The following audio was captured on that tape recorder. There's two of them across the creek at the big rocks. After leaving the camp, Moorhead would send the recording off to be analyzed and authenticated by Dr. R. Lynn Curlin, a professor of electrical engineering at the University of Wyoming. He concluded that the tape had not been spliced or edited in any way, and that it was in fact a legitimate one-take recording. He also added that the vocalizations created by these creatures alluded to them being physically larger than an average man. Their height was estimated to be anywhere from 7 foot 3 to 8 feet tall, and did not appear to have a known language pattern that could be tied to anything human. Yeah, I've gotta say, um, the Sierra sounds have put me at a loss. I'm really kind of hard pressed to figure out what those sounds are. At first I thought it might have been maybe like an owl, I know owls are capable of making some absolutely heinous noises, but I wasn't able to find anything even remotely close. I do have to concur with, you know, the general consensus that it sounds like a couple of apes communicating with each other. I mean, the whooping, like the weird kind of, you know, guttural noises, I mean, you, you heard the tape, it sounds so strange, and I guess this kind of directly challenges my opinions on, you know, Bigfoot and Sasquatch and the like. I've always kind of held that, you know, I, I just don't really believe in their existence, but I don't know, man, if this wasn't an owl or, you know, a couple of guys playing a prank, then what the hell was it? I guess I'm half tempted to to just say that like it, it might have been a prank you know a couple of guys just joshing each other out in the woods but i don't know man i am not sure i guess it's just one of those things that you're gonna have to internalize and and figure out for yourself i'm not gonna say that it has totally like changed my opinion on bigfoot i still don't definitively believe that it exists but you know, it's stuff like this that has the capability to change someone's mind, and I, I don't know, man. It's done something to my faith, so I, I guess that's all I can say about it. All right, then. I think that's going to wrap us up for now. That was the third layer of the most complete iceberg. I really enjoyed researching some of the topics on this layer, 
and I hope you found them as interesting as I did. If you did enjoy the video, I would greatly appreciate it if you liked, subscribed, and commented on the video. It helps me out in the algorithm, and it just generally gives me motivation to keep doing these videos. I am also always open to video suggestions down in the comments below, and I cannot wait to see you all in the next installment. Anyways, talk is cheap, and your time is probably pretty expensive, so I think that's gonna do it. Have a good one, and I'll catch y'all in a little bit. See ya.